um, but more specifically aquaponics and how um, uh, its potential role to, to provide a, a food production um, system within a vertical farming context. Um, I refer to aquaponics as an ecosystem approach to food production. It's utilizing natural systems and the way that they interact um, with one another. So first, uh, we've touched on it a few times already this morning, why farm, farm vertically? Um, we are in a situation where our urban sort of areas are expanding quite rapidly, putting a huge demand on our rural areas. So there's big land use conflicts that are starting to occur. We've also, as it's been mentioned, got a huge rise in population at the moment, going from in the 60s about 3 billion up to, in the year 2000, about 6 billion and set to reach 9.1 by the year 2050. Similarly, um, if we are to, to actually uh, have this massive population increase, we're going to need a, a whole load more food. In fact, it's been predicted 70% more food by 2050 to meet this rise in population. There's also the, the fact that um, oil is running out, whether you accept peak oil or, or ignore it, um, it's, it's quite widely recognised that the, the ability to extract cheap oil is over, um, and now it's becoming, it's using more energy to, to take that oil out of the ground. It sort of gives rise to an argument that someone mentioned earlier on, that at the moment we're shipping water around the globe, but most worryingly we're using oil which should really be used for making plastics and, and all sorts of other valuable compounds, and we're burning it to send this water halfway around the globe. So it's not really a case, I don't think, of, of if, but more a case of when. So in terms of if we actually want to farm vertically, what sort of um, requirements are there? I think we need to learn a lot of the lessons from the past. We need to create sustainable systems in these vertical farming contexts. But we need to, obviously, with the, the huge cost of land in city centres and the huge cost of these buildings, by the, by the looks of most of them, we're going to need quite intensive cropping systems. We're going to need to get a lot out of them. But also, I think it's going to be essential for us to join up various systems together, to use the wastes from one system as a resource and an input to another system, if we're to, to maximise the, um, the potential. We've also got to be quite pragmatic about the, the crop selection. Someone mentioned early on that maybe urban agriculture and vertical farming is going to be supplementary um, to, to sort of standard conventional farming. And I think that's, that's probably quite right. It maybe makes more sense to grow perishable, high-value crops in vertical farming systems rather than some of the longer cropping um, types like orchards, I see sort of listed as quite a common um, part of vertical farming systems. We need to minimise the amount of external inputs. If we're having a, a, a vertical farming system in the, middle of, um, in the middle of London or Nottingham, for example, it's going to be unrealistic to ship in tonnes and tonnes of, of nitrogenous fertilisers or other inputs to the farming systems. So we need to think quite consciously about that. And we also need to maximise the production per unit area. These are going to be expensive spaces to grow food in. Um, so I think that's really something we've got to bear in mind. So I'm going to talk to you about um, two technologies, really, that when combined form something called aquaponics. We have aquaculture, or the, the growing of, of aquatic organisms in water, and hydroponics, uh, obviously the, the growing of plants without soil. Now when we combine these two technologies, we, we use the best of both worlds in some, in some elements. It comes with, with a whole load of different challenges. But what we're doing is we're essentially taking the waste products of the fish in the water um, and using that as a nutrient source for the plants. And then the plants in turn provide a filtration system to remove those nutrients from the water so that it can be recirculated again. So it's, it's more about recycling, recycling wastes back into resources. It's about creating ecosystems in areas where very often they wouldn't otherwise exist. It's about combining different technologies. It's not just about aquaculture and hydroponics. You'll see from some of our work, we try and, um, as a gentleman before described, integrating other technologies like vermiculture or renewable energy into these systems. It's also about promoting biodiversity um, by, having, by having sort of diversity within a system. Also comes robustness. If we have sort of general monocrop systems, they generally are quite, um, quite susceptible to changes and, and, and um, breaking down, if you like. But it's ultimately about producing food, and that's what I'm going to go into a little bit more now, and particularly appropriate, um, given that you're all probably quite hungry. 
If we look at a system in terms of its inputs and outputs, it was mentioned again earlier on that that's how we assess the efficiency of a system. We look first at aquaculture. We have a three-stage process really where we're growing a fish. Fish produce ammonia both from, from their urine but also from their gills. And that ammonia can be converted by nitrifying bacteria into nitrite and then into nitrate. And nitrate is obviously a, a, a nitrogen um, source for plants which can then be taken up. But in an aquaculture system, we, we need these nitrifying bacteria or biological filtration, but we also need mechanical filtration to remove solids and particles from the water. So this system requires fish food. Um, there's a whole different lecture here on sort of the sustainability issues of where fish food comes from, how it's derived, but we won't go into that now. Um, energy as well, in terms of physically moving water around the system, running these filters, um, heating the water sometimes, um, and also water. Um, recirculating aquaculture is characterized by using less than 10% of its system volume per day, but that's still quite a lot in some of these large aquacultural systems. And the outputs, fish. Um, it's deemed a, a sustainable and quite a joined up solution just producing fish. But perhaps we're missing a trick. So if we look at aquaponics, what we're really doing is we're using the same nitrifying bacteria, the biological filtration, but we're integrating plants into the system as a harvestable edible filter. Sounds simple, it's not always so simple. But the result is that we make better use of, of the water, we can actually recirculate and only bring in 0.5 to 5% of the system volume per day, but we get two different outputs, and in fact the plants are often far more valuable than the fish due to the fast cropping cycles. Then if we look at vermiculture, it's just been covered quite comprehensively, um, but we can take the wastes from the fish, um, which are obviously then growing the plants, but when we, when we harvest a plant, we've got the root system, possibly the outer leaves, or some crops that simply don't meet the standards. So those can be composted to provide free real outputs. Compost itself for soil enrichment, um, for removal and use elsewhere. Worm teas, um, or liquors as, as the other chap called them, which can be used as a, a biopesticide or to some extent a, a foliar plant feed. And the worms themselves, which can obviously be fed back to the fish. So this is reducing the amount of inputs into the system by reducing our, our requirement for fish food, but providing a few more outputs to the system. Then, we, the next one, black soldier flies, the chap mentioned it there, we've done quite a lot of work on these, whereby they'll, they'll deal with all of the wastes that composting won't be able to deal with, so uncooked meat, um, cooked meat, all sorts of different materials, and they're incredible little creatures that will rapidly <coughs> break down and convert it into a, into a usable form of protein. There is a bit of a problem um, in terms of the animal byproducts legislation and all the lessons that we've learned from uh, the mad cow disease and <coughs> that sort of thing. So we're, we're not recommending that we would feed fish, feed soldier flies fish and then feed those soldier flies back to fish. We're actually saying, well, if we decouple these systems and we put the fish wastes um, in terms of mortalities, the processing wastes, the guts, the heads, the things that we don't eat, and then we feed those to soldier flies for them to be able to convert them into little parcels of protein, which can then be fed to another animal. Chickens absolutely love them. And then in turn, we use the chicken waste to feed back to soldier flies, which then go back into the fish. So we've got these two cycles occurring at the same time. The next one, another personal favorite of mine, um, the giant freshwater prawn. We've just set up um, a giant freshwater prawn hatchery in Norfolk. Uh, where we've taken uh, most of the brood stock or all of the brood stock from the University of Stirling, and we're going to be sort of selectively breeding and supplying these to people growing um, in their own home, home commercial farms. So the idea with, with giant freshwater prawns, we do a lot of growing on floating rafts. So we have a, a body of water, perhaps like about six to centimetres deep, with a raft floating on the top, plant roots submerged into the water, and that creates an ideal dark oxygen-rich medium in which prawns stocked extensively um, grow and, and, and happily live and they provide a really nice almost free output to the system. In terms of the fish breeding, um, we don't necessarily need to be reliant on, on getting supplies of fry and fingerlings from outside. It's 
very possible to breed fish um, to then perpetuate the cycle, to be resilient from, from external input, but also create another income stream for the farm, being able to sell those, those fry or the, those eggs to other people. And energy. I mean, if you look at the inputs, we're still quite water heavy, we're quite um, sort of energy heavy still. One way of dealing with that, it's been sort of like a little bit of a contentious issue, and I'm going to give you our take on, on how we can use PV in a little bit. But the idea really to take some of the sun's energy, and it's, it's undisputed that the sun produces more energy than plants need. In fact, it can be prohibitive, prohibitive to growth in some instances, which is why glass houses use shading, for example. So we can capture some of that excess energy, convert it into electricity to help run our pumps and decrease, again, the reliance on outside inputs. Another technology we're, we're utilizing quite a lot probably won't work in, in urban farming situations where you've got uh, exhaust gas emissions and things like that, but we do a lot of work with biomass and biomass power stations where we use the waste heat to provide a, a, a valuable input to a system. But we can use the sun's energy, which is captured in the form of biomass or wood, and then efficiently combust that wood to provide heat to go back into the, into the system. We can obviously capture the CO2 and use that as an input as well. So we're slowly really reaching a point where water is, whilst quite a low input um, sort of, uh, in relation to many other systems, it's still quite a big issue. Rainwater harvesting has been around for a long time. Everyone's very aware of, of how it works. Um, but capturing the, the water that falls on a system, storing it, and then using that water to top back up um, the system when you need it. So ultimately, I think what I was trying to very simplistically illustrate, it's about creating more from less. It's about trying to utilize the resources as efficiently as possible to, to try and put back the wastes from one part to provide an input to another. So I'm just going to talk briefly about um, what I think some of the major challenges are in, in terms of uh, urban agriculture. I think the first one is, is knowledge exchange. It, it's going to require a lot of different skill sets from a lot of different kinds of people to make this work. And I think it's, it's also so innovative that very often the people that are needed the most are head down doing their own thing and they're not perhaps sharing information as much as they should do. So I think that's going to be one of the major challenges. I think it's also creating buildings that maximise the use of natural resources. We touched, um, or Mark did a little bit, on the idea of using a south-facing wall for PV and putting all the plants where there's no light. Um, seems crazy. So I think we need to look, what have we got for free? How can we use it before we start um, changing things? I think we need to determine what are the most appropriate technologies for vertical farming. It may not be that aquaponics is one of them, I think it is, um, but it may be that there are other appropriate technologies that can be brought together um, to really make this happen. <laughs> and I think one of the biggest challenges as a grower, um, a person farming in a skyscraper that might have cost 10, 100 million pounds, is going to be the huge overheads in terms of production. So the only way I think that's really going to work is if whether it's subsidised, but if it's, if it's not and it's got to stand alone, we've got to, to basically increase the margins to compensate for that overhead. And we can do that quite well, because we're going to be putting the production at the heart of the demand in the urban centres. So I think we need to, yeah, I said that already. So in terms of the knowledge exchange, I think it starts with events just like this, people talking, sharing ideas, and, and, and adapting your own ideas based on other people's experiences. I think we need to have an effective open mechanism for, for logging this information, for evolving it, and for eventually getting to a point where we've got a system that we're all happy with. And I think it really takes, there's a lot of different stakeholders involved, and there's a lot of different um, disciplines that need to be listened to, from the microbial sort of food safety element to the people that are actually going to eat the food. Um, I mean, a lot of people talk about growing crops that there isn't actually a demand for sometimes, just for the sake of growing them. The building envelope itself, um, three big production costs in aquaponics or aquaculture, energy, labor, and feed. I think we can address some of the labor issues, but we perhaps don't want to. We're in a, in a climate where employment is a good thing. So let's put that one to one side. 
For feed, we've shown how we can use other waste to decrease the amount of, of inputs to the system. But energy is still a major production cost. I think we need to integrate renewable energy, not uh, in the way that um, people have done in the past, slapping a windmill on the roof, but actually looking consciously about energy flows and resource flows within the building. If we're producing hundreds of tons of crops in a skyscraper, how can we design the building to transport those, those crops to a point where they're, they're sold or consumed? I think we should be looking at innovative building material. ETFE is something that's been talked about or touched on a few times. It's something we worked and are working with. But we need to really look at these materials and proof them. You know, it's not enough just to say that looks like a good alternative. We need mechanisms like life cycle assessment to truly validate what is a good option and what isn't. We've been carrying out uh, an LCA study for DEFRA looking at exactly that, the, the potential for UK grown food as opposed to importing from overseas. And I can talk you through the results a bit later if you like. I think we need to be integrating elements of passive building design. We need to be maximizing the natural resources and harnessing that within the structure itself. And I think the most important point is we need to not look at these two things being separate. The food and the energy system should be one and the same. In an aquaponics system, we very often have hundreds of thousands of litres of water. That water is, a, is an incredible thermal mass that can be used to shift energy around the building. So there shouldn't be a separation between these two elements. There should, in fact, be a conscious and um, interface between the two, really. In terms of the appropriate technology, it's again been touched on, as I thought it would. Having a skyscraper that is only for farming, does that really make sense? Is it better to integrate living spaces, office space, with food production? I think a lot of people would like to rent an office in a big green building, and you can offset some of the value or the, the cost by having high rent or high um, sort of area. What's the word? Yeah, some people pay more rent than others, and you can sort of stabilise it across the board. I think we need to be streaming waste back in to the system. We need to be much more consciously looking at composting, black soldier flies, elements where we can turn those wastes back into, into inputs for the system. It's also a case in, in uh, an aquaponic system that, that there's gas, gas exchange going on. Fish are producing CO2, plants need it. Plants are producing oxygen and the fish need that. So consciously coupling these two systems together with active and passive heat recovery ventilation all sorts of different options. But it should always be about site-specific solutions. There isn't, and I don't think there should be, one-size-fits-all solutions to these sort of things. We need to look, what is the market? Who are the people? What, what communities, what consumers are we engaging with? And we need to adapt the system accordingly. We need to create resilient food systems. I think uh, we call it a closed-loop food production system or approaching a closed loop food production system. It's obviously not because we're adding fish food or, or some element of, of energy, but approaching that, that kind of ethos really. I think we need to produce a diverse range of crops. I did a lot of work on the, um, the differences between monocultures mono, mono of different crops versus diverse integrated farms over in Southeast Asia for quite a few years and really saw the value of, of people managing biodiversity as opposed to um, very <coughs> resource dependent sort of production systems. <coughs> Leads on to the, to the idea with diversity and biodiversity, much easier to manage pests, to use integrated pest management systems that allow us to, to control these, um, to control pests through management as opposed to eradicating them. We need to engage the public. I think that's really important for vertical farming. It might be seen as something a little bit far off, but when it does happen, um, it needs to be something that's, that's very consciously tied in with, with what people want. And we need to ensure that these systems can adapt to changes in demand. If we designed a 40-story skyscraper to produce lettuce or spinach, and then people the next year didn't want to eat it anymore, it'd be pretty useless. So there needs to be some flexibility involved. Just you standing up, me, and I'm running out of time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, everyone else. I'll, 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 yeah, speed it up. 
So our approach so far, really to operate sustainably in our own right. We're a social enterprise um, set up out of a complete disillusionment with academia, which might not um, sit very well with most of you. Um, but it was really just seeing how priorities shift, funding comes and goes, and there's a lack of continuity in pushing things forward. We, we want to empower a grassroots level appreciation of, of some of these sort of philosophies. We want to push the boundaries in urban agriculture. We don't really want to just talk about it. We want to actually do it. And we want to develop commercially appropriate aquaponic systems in a number of different contexts. So just very quickly giving you some images of, of how we're pushing the boundaries or trying to in our own little way. We've been looking at a, a Chinese lean-to type greenhouse model, which we've been trying to adapt and evolve and using new and what we think are appropriate technologies to, to create something better, I guess. Now the concept, oh, went back to front. The concept of a solar greenhouse is a south facing, using a very thick thermal mass wall on the north side and allowing a lot of energy during the day to be stored in the thermal mass to, to give off that heat at night time and be able to create a much more stable um, growing condition. We've incorporated sort of five key ingredients, as we call them. ETFE, uh, passive ETFE, um, for the film itself, uh, for a number of reasons. Multifunctional PV, uh, sulfur plasma lighting, uh, an ETFE PAR screen, which is trying to shift wavelengths and look at making more light um, within the photoactive radiation. And aquaponics. How this might look, we've actually just yesterday been commissioned by Planet Earth to um, look at a 2.4 acre site and put up seven of these um, aquaponic solar greenhouses. The ETFE itself, I'll probably leave to Phil to talk about later because he's, um, he's maybe had more time than I will. Multifunctional photovoltaics. Um, basically the idea is to use PV to shade. So, the idea is when, we, when we've got too much light for the plants, we will use photovoltaics as a shading mechanism to take some of that light out, produce energy to then run lighting when we don't have so much energy. How that works is we've got these two series of panels, sort of like lamella, um, which rotate. So depending on, um, depending on the, the amount of light that you need, you can see the extent of shading here when they're um, in, in their different phases. They're also hollow, so we can pass air down the centre of the panel, cooling it, increasing the, the effectiveness of the panel, but also creating another heat source within the system. Sulfur plasma lighting, speak to the chaps outside. Um, this ETFE PAR film, um, basically, again, I'll, I'll cover that in discussions later on with anyone that's interested. And we took that a step further and actually tried to make a water wall, so using the same sort of principle, but running water through it, getting extra thermal mass and effectively um, heating that water up. A number of different experiments looking at how, how we can develop that. I will very quickly give you a few slides. Uh, urban agriculture, being talked about a lot, isn't done that often. This is one example which we worked with a group of guys down in London to effectively, um, we wanted to create a farm in a shop. Our approach to date has been really that there are so many underutilized urban resources. You know, it seems crazy to build a massive skyscraper when there's poor warehouses sitting empty next to it. So our idea was to take a standard empty um, space to bring people and communities together around food, to engage them, and to give an example of what urban agriculture looks like. So we've got a building given to us by Hackney Council. Um, we then looked at aquaponics in the base, well, in the sort of front room, chickens on the roof, mushrooms in the basement, polytunnel composting outside, a kitchen to process the food that we grow and add value to it, then a cafe space where people can come and sit, a meeting room which we can rent out that's covered with, with food. Um, this was the building when we arrived there. About a month or so later, turned it into effectively, it's not the most productive per unit area because it's designed to be quite engaging and have lots of people coming in and out of it. But a tiered hydroponic style growing system, giant freshwater prawns in the bottom, uh, vertical towers that we call vegetable kebabs, and the idea really was a bit like a donut kebab that rotates around a heat source, 
the idea was to rotate plants around the light source. It seemed to make sense. At this stage, they weren't there. Tilapia, and exactly the idea that the chap talked about before, I want that one, comes out in a net and gets cooked for you in the cafe. <coughs> just very quickly going through some slides. And the most, the best thing really was just people you know, engaging in food, asking questions, really wanting to, to get involved. We grew kaffir bacteria, part of an experiment on the culture of London, <coughs> looking at how we can spread the bacterial culture and follow the same, same sort of route. Chickens on the roof, Jamie Oliver came and did a program with us, but he thought that urban agriculture was so exciting, he shelved the program and he's going to do one himself, which is a bit annoying. <laughs> um, the meeting room, sort of basil walls, all quite, you know, very low budget. Not the sort of thing that we do if we were well resourced, but this was a load of guys coming together saying, We need to do this. How can we do it with what we've got? A hydroponic room upstairs, growing tomato, showing different techniques for if you wanted to show what was possible and how you could do it. A polytunnel outside, and that doubled up as, you know, at night we'd run food screenings, cinema screenings around food. Um, people could sit there, watch things, hosting talks, quite an engaging space. Lots of people, and that's how it looks from the outside. It's quite funny, the bus stop right at the top, so you get a double decker bus driving up, people on the top layer look out and see a load of chickens. <laughs> well, this is some funny, funny faces. Very quickly, another project, community sort of project that we worked on in Moffat. We took a disused church, which we bought for a pound, put 10 kilowatts of PV on the roof, similar sort of solar greenhouse on the south side, using the thermal mass, again, insulated inside. Um, to yeah, produce things aquaponically. And it's part of a recycling depot, now employing 17 people, recycling aluminium, plastic glass, cooking oil, which then runs the recycling vans, picking everything up, very tidy. So that's how it looks. Um, this is one shot. These aren't the only fish <coughs> in the system, these are just the nursery tanks where we put the little fry before we put them in the on-growing tanks. And about four weeks later, quite a lot of growth all sorts of different crops. You can see here, this is a sort of four week cycle with four week old lettuce, three, two, and, and one just going into seedlings. Floating rafts again, so these tanks of water, plants grown on the raft with their roots suspended in oxygen rich water underneath. Some of the composting and very heat Robinson and a biodiesel that was a little bit hazardous. Um, we also did a program called The Home of the Future, quite recently approached by Channel 4, to, to see, it was an EON funded project, to see how a family might live in the future, what, what sort of techniques will they need, how will they grow their food. So we designed, uh, initial idea was to have chickens, have soldier flies, the full whammy, but they thought it was a bit good life, so they told us to sort of shelve the chickens and just stay with the greenhouse. This is what we constructed. Um, quite small, certainly not vertical, but embodies many of the technologies um, that we're talking about. And quite a smart water bath at the side, shaped like a prawn. And inside, um, we had giant freshwater prawns, tilapia, a whole range of edible and medicinal plants, um, and even two little chameleons that were part of the bio sort of pest control. And very quickly, um, a site that we're working on in Rotterdam, uh, another disused big building, um, an urban farm, soon to be one of the biggest urban farms in, in Europe, I think, um, but it's been squatted for about 20 years. We've been looking at how to develop it and designing a system over the last six months, and it's due to be built in the next month, um, so it's quite exciting. That's how it looks like, four acres of sort of outdoor space, um, lots of rooftop and lots of opportunities. So just very quickly to summarise, I'm sorry I've rushed it. Um, closing the loop, meeting our global challenges. If we are to produce 70% more food by 2050, we're going to need to produce more with less. If we're to feed our growing population, this massively growing population, we're going to need to produce food everywhere we can. And I think if we're to reconnect people, because there is a massive disconnection between people and food, we need to excite them, we need to engage them, and we need to inspire them in some of these technologies and get them on board. <laughs>